If you don't know, my name is Kevin Ha. I'm the lead pastor of New City Church. And uh, we're in the middle of a sermon series called Genesis, the Origin Story. And today's sermon is entitled Stairway from Heaven. You know, I, I grew up going to church all my life. Um, my mom and dad, uh, there were leaders in the church. My dad was an elder in a church. I always believed in God, but I never really knew God as I was growing up. He was a little distance. I felt like to follow God means to follow all the rules uh, of being a Christian. Uh, that that he was a that God was a pretty strict God, and he had a lot of rules. And, you know, I remember when I was in high school, I felt kind of bummed that I was a Christian because I had to follow all these rules. And I thought if you did so, then God would bless you. That's how I perceived what Christianity was all about. But one day I encountered God. I felt the sense that God revealed himself to me. And Christianity no longer became something that I did because my parents did it or because I wanted the blessings of God through obedience. But it was something that I experienced on my own and I, something in my heart welled up to live life in a different way. I want to ask you, how about you? What is your encounter with God? Have you had an encounter with God? I would love to hear your story. You know, in fact, um, some of you I know the story, some of you I don't. I would love to get together, maybe on Zoom, maybe on the phone, maybe in person. Let's get together. I would love to hear your story of how God has revealed himself to you. And but today I want to... I want to focus on the story of Jacob's encounter with God. And here is the context for today's story. So, as you know, God promised Abraham that he will bless him. And through him, bless all the nations. And Abraham had trouble having kids, but finally had one through uh, Sarah. Um, but he had two kids, Ishmael and Isaac. And the blessing went to the miracle child, Isaac, the younger child. That's who God chose. And now Isaac had twin boys, and their names are Esau and Jacob. Esau is the firstborn. He is a manly man. He's very masculine. He's, he's got a lot of hair. In fact, he was born with a lot of hair. So the word, uh, the name Esau actually means hairy. As in, as in, like, not like me. And so, uh, you know, he's got a lot of hair. And he was a hunter. He was an outdoors guy. Um, he was an aggressive guy. Uh, on the other hand, his brother Jacob, the younger brother, uh, was more of a homeboy. You know, he liked to stay home. He liked to cook. And... Um, and because of that, Isaac, his father, loved Esau more, the scripture tells us. And interestingly, uh, when Rebecca, Rebecca is Isaac's wife, and Pastor Tracy preached on Rebecca last week. When Rebecca was pregnant, um, God announced to Rebecca that Jacob would receive the blessing, not Esau, that Esau will serve. Jacob. But Isaac ignores that and wants his first son Esau to be blessed. But Jacob wants the blessings of a firstborn as well. And Rebekah, having received God's will, she wants to make sure that he gets, uh, that Jacob gets the blessing as well. But you know, in, in the midst of all this, we have a son, Jacob, who is hungering to be accepted and loved and affirmed by his father. But growing up, he never gets that. So when Jacob is old and blind, 
he announces to Esau that he wants to bless him. And so Rebekah quickly comes up with a plan to get Isaac to bless Jacob instead. And Jacob agrees to go along with the plan. Jacob dresses up like Esau and goes to Isaac to get his blessing. Remember, Isaac is blind at this point. He gets the blessing from the father, but when Esau comes back from hunting, he is ticked off. You can imagine how Esau felt at this point, right? He's ticked off. He is so angry that he consoles himself by planning to kill Jacob once his father Isaac dies. That's his plan. So Jacob has to flee home, which is the land of Canaan, the promised land. And he's on his way to Haran, a land called Haran, where his uncle Laban, Laban, L-A-B-A-N, lives. It's about 400 miles away. So let's catch the story at Genesis chapter 28, verses 10 to 22. Jacob left Beersheba and set off for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because, because the sun has set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with this top reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, God of your father Abraham, God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. All the people on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, Surely the Lord is in this place. I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his, bed, uh, under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel. This is where the word Bethel comes from. All the churches named Bethel. This is where it comes from. Bethel. Though the city used to be called Lutz, when Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey, I am uh, journey I'm taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's household, then the Lord will be my God and this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house and all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. So we're going to go through this story looking at three things. One, the darkness of Jacob's situation, and two, Jacob's encounter with this stairway from heaven, and, and, and the meaning of this stairway. And then third, um, how the stairway comes for you and me. Okay, so first of all, um, let's look at the darkness of Jacob's situation. Verse 11 says that he reached a certain place. It doesn't even have a name. It's a nameless place until later on. It's, it's marked by, it's not marked by any river or any landmark. In other words, it's not an important place. It's in the middle of nowhere. It's in the middle of the desert. He's somewhere in between Canaan and Haran. Jacob is not only not the leader of his family that he had hoped to become, he is out in the middle of nowhere when this happens. The passage says he used a stone for a pillow. I mean, am I the only one who thinks that that's kind of weird? Although I heard some Koreans use stone as a pillow 
But anyway, that's just beside the point. Uh, but it's a very uncomfortable thing to use as a pillow. I mean, who does that? Um, I mean, it means, I think, that he had nothing else. You know, if you have a, uh, if, if you're carrying something, you ball it up, you know, and you make it into a pillow, right? If you're, if you're uh, sleeping in the middle of nowhere. But here he is, he has nothing. That's why he's using a stone as a pillow. He has nothing. He's got nothing to show for himself. The passage also says that it was night. The sun has set. It's a physical description, but I, I think it also describes the inner condition of Jacob as well. Let's think about his emotional pain that he might be going through, that he's carrying. He grew up with father wounds. The scripture tells us that Isaac loved Esau. Have you ever felt like your, your parents love your siblings more than they loved you? Maybe one of them did. I mean, that's a painful feeling. But the scripture tells us pretty clearly that Isaac loved Esau. I mean, he was this hairy guy. He was this hunter. He was this masculine man man that we talked about this earlier and Jacob was this quiet guy who loved to cook loved to stay home you know I, I as I was thinking about this passage I was wondering if Jacob ever felt like he was not loved by his father because he wasn't man enough to be loved by his father but that's the way Jacob was. He, was. he was a softer person. He's not a traditional male. And for that, his father withdrew his love for him and didn't affirm him. Have you ever felt like this in your life? You know, I, 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 as I was working on this sermon, I couldn't help but to think about the mistakes that I made that my wife and I made as a parent of a bisexual non-binary child although Grace and I said all the right things and we tried our best you know we told them we love you no matter what it took us some time to affirm them Grace and I caused emotional wounds that we're still dealing with. I know that those of you who are queer could definitely identify with Jacob's pain. And, if you, and, if, and it, even if you're not, even if you're not LGBTQ, many of us carry father wounds or mother wounds. Uh, maybe they didn't affirm you. Maybe you grew up with a sense that you're a disappointment to them. Maybe you grew up feeling like you're a second thought after your more successful sibling. Maybe you grew up with a sense that you didn't quite live up to their expectations. Maybe, maybe you grew up with a father or a mother who abused you physically, verbally, or emotionally. Or maybe they were just absent for your, from your life. It doesn't matter why they were absent. But the fact that they were absent from your life brings you pain when you think about it. And you're still brewing with some anger underneath all of your emotion. And you can't help but to feel that wound in your life. You know, for Jacob, it wasn't just this emotional pain that he, he, was, uh, he was in a dark place with. He was also in a dark place morally. He is manipulative, deceptive, and opportunistic. You know, we, even before the episode about you know, dressing up as Esau to get the blessing, um, there was an episode in which he stole the first the right of first form from Esau for a bowl of soup. I mean, who does that? 
I mean, it, it's a, it's a very he's a he's a very opportunistic guy. You see his character falls all throughout the story. He deceives his brother, his father, and his uncle. We'll hear about that later on in the story. And all of these things have caused him to run for his life. Things haven't worked out the way he had hoped. You know, his life is falling apart. He's sleeping outside without a pillow. Have you experienced that? I know some of you have. He's completely and utterly alone. He might even feel like God's not doing anything. Heaven is completely closed. It's not just that God's power and action are absent. God himself seems so far away for Jacob. You know, everybody else, you know, they, they encounter God and receive this blessing from God. Abraham encountered God, received God's blessing directly. Isaac, his father, encountered God, received this blessing. His mother, Rebecca, encountered God and received the affirmation of the blessing from God. And maybe he heard the stories of how his family encountered this Yahweh God. But at this point in his life, God is completely remote to him. He's never encountered God. And everything seems hopeless. He's experiencing the dark night of the soul. Have you ever experienced that in your life? You know, when you were young, you had so many dreams. You had so many hope. But things didn't work out the way they hoped, the way you had hoped. Maybe that relationship didn't work out the way you hoped. And you feel like you're all alone. You wonder where God is. Maybe you prayed and, and maybe you have some sense that God's going to guide you and, and bless you. But you, you look at your situation now and it seems so dark. You know, you're, maybe you're having a hard time getting a job or you don't know where the next rent check is coming from. Or maybe your relationships are on the rocks and you wonder where God is. Or maybe you have run away from something and it feels like you're right now in the middle of a desert right now. Some of you are medicating yourself just just to survive, just to feel something. You wonder where God is. Sometimes it just feels like heaven is close to you. God seems so far away. Whether it's something that you did or, or the pain that you experienced or you are going through and you yell out to God for help, but he doesn't seem to be there. Where is God when it hurts so much? And sometimes we begin to face this sense of dryness, aloneness, even lostness. Like we just hit a wall. It feels like we just can't get through to God. It, it's like the heaven is closed. And sometimes it's because something happened in our lives. Maybe we got sick or relational failure or, or losing a job or someone close to us has died or but sometimes nothing has happened but you still feel like you just hit a wall and you don't really understand what's going on you know and sometimes even when things are going well there's this sense of emptiness in our heart that we sometimes can't seem to get rid of we keep on saying that if only you get this or that, or only if you find that someone, or only if you can make this relationship work, then it'll be okay. But even, if you, even after you get what you were looking for, you still feel this sense of emptiness. It's, it's kind of like the feeling you have after a wild party. I don't know. It's been a while since I've been to a wild party, but you party, you have a lot of fun, and then the light comes on then you go home 
the buzz is gone and only the hangover remains and you feel this sense of aloneness and you feel this sense of meaninglessness. That's how Jacob feels right now. Alone, empty, lost, penniless. So what happens to Jacob in the midst of this darkness? He encounters the stairway from heaven. I, I, he, he, I think what he dreamt must have been really stunning. Um, if you look at verse 12, it says that he had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with his top... Um, with his top reaching to heaven and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. You know, angels um, are majestic beings in the Bible. They're not babies with wings. You know, that, that's just from ancient art. They're majestic beings. They come from the royal court of God and they are the people who carry out God's will. They are the intermediaries between earth and heaven. And verse 13 says, There above it stood the Lord, and he said... You know, I, I looked at the original language here. It, it, it's not above it in the sense of above uh, the stairs at the top. No, it literally says, Over him stood the Lord. Over him stood the Lord. I, I think this means that God actually comes down to Jacob and is in a position of intimacy with him. He is close to him. When Jacob is absolutely friendless at this point, when he's completely alone, when, when he has no one, the Lord said, I am with you and will not leave you. Do you hear that? I am with you. I will not leave you. When Jacob is out in the wild, he's unprotected from harm, the elements, the, the humans or the animals, or where, where, there, where he's completely defenseless, the Lord says, I will watch over you. When Jacob is completely broke, the Lord says, I will bless you with this land. I will do what I said. I will absolutely bless you and give you everything I have promised. When Jacob feels that his life is completely useless and without purpose, when he feels completely lost, God says to him, I will bless all the people of the earth through your offspring. Now, I, I want to dig a little bit deeper into the meaning of the stairway right here. It's, it's a dramatic story in the Bible. What is the meaning of the encounter with the stairway from heaven? So I want to I note four things. Number one, Jacob doesn't ask for it. He didn't ask for it. He doesn't deserve it. But out of God's love and grace, God comes down to Jacob and showers him with love, affirmation, and blessing. Do you notice that? Did he ask for this? No, he didn't. Did he deserve this? No, he didn't. And the Lord comes and showers him. There is not a single word of condemnation against Jacob. He doesn't condemn him for cheating his brother or deceiving his father. He only comes with unconditional blessing and love. Look at what the Lord says. I will bless you. I will be with you no matter what. Wherever you go, I will protect you. There is no if. If you do this, 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 if comes from Jacob later on. But God doesn't use an if. It's unconditional. God's love for Jacob, God's love for you is unconditional. There is no if or but to, to his love for us. Our God's love and affirmation for you likewise is unconditional. There is no but or if. 
He will bless you. It's not because you've done the right thing. It's not because you lived up to his expectations and rules. It's not because of anything that you deserve. It is merely because God's love for you. It is because of his grace for you. So that's the first thing. The second, this event also means that God is doing something. Even if we don't see what he's doing. His angels are coming and going constantly in this vision, right? There, there are a lot of things going on that we do not see. Jacob doesn't see what God is doing, particularly in times of darkness. But that doesn't mean God is not doing anything. It's like God is opening the curtains and showing what is really going on. He's showing the reality of the situation. And do you know what this reality looks like? Heaven is open. God is doing something. Whether or not Jacob, you, I feel like something is going on. Whether or not we can see that is going on. It doesn't matter. God is at work. Amen? Say that with me. God is at work. Even if I don't see him. This passage tells us that we can see with our eye. What we can see with our eye is not all there is to reality. In fact, if we opened our eyes to the realm of true reality, we will see. We will see greater beauty. You know, the, this always reminds me of the story of Elijah, um, where Elisha, S-H-A, where one of his servants was afraid because they were surrounded by their enemies. But this is what Elisha set, prayed in 2 Kings 6 uh, chapter 6, verse 16 to 17. He says, do not be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, Open his eyes, O Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. See, when you and I are feeling lonely, when we're feeling abandoned, or when we're feeling like God is not near us, and when we're maybe in the middle of a depression, or when maybe we're in our sins, and maybe we're just in our pain, let us allow our eyes to be open and see what God is doing. You know, every night at 10 o'clock, I lead a practice on Facebook Live called The Daily Examine. I invite you to join me. Um, just go to the New City Facebook page at 10 p.m. every night. The Daily Examine is not just the practice of examining ourselves, of our, you know, the sins in our heart and our lives and, you know, that, that, that's, that's one thing that we do, but it's a way to notice God's presence, to notice God's participation and activity in our lives. It's a way to step back at the end of the day and see what God is doing in our lives. Because oftentimes throughout the day, we don't see God doing stuff in our lives. So we need to kind of step back at the end of the day and go, what was God doing today? Did I notice God's presence and activity in my life? We get so busy that we need to stop and be silent so we can see what God is doing in our lives. Because you know what? What God is doing is way bigger than what we can imagine. What God can see is way bigger and greater than what we can see. He sees everything. He, he, he's not trapped in time even. He sees the whole picture. You know, when we're in a maze, we can, only, we can only see what's in front of us and behind us. Maybe learn a little bit from our mistakes. But if you look at the maze from the top, you see everything. And God sees everything from the top. 
it's hard for us who's trapped in time to see what's going on and see the whole picture. But God sees the whole picture. And I know that sometimes we get angry at God for not stopping a particular suffering in our lives. And there's just so much to that question. But I think part of the answer is that we have to humble ourselves and acknowledge that we don't see the whole picture. And I know God calls us to express our authentic emotion to Him through the spiritual practice of lament. Cry out to God, complain at God, get angry at God. God invites you to express yourself to Him. But even as we do that, I think we have to come to a place where we realize that I don't see everything, but God sees everything. So that's the second thing about the stairway. God is doing something even if we don't see what that is. Angels are going back and forth, back and forth, even if you don't see it. Third, it also means that often it's at the times of our weaknesses, our brokenness, that God reveals himself to us. You know, so why does God choose to unveil the curtain of heaven at this time in Jacob's life? God has never shown himself to Jacob at any other time before this. I think it's because there's a time in our lives when everything is stripped away so that God could really show up. And we can really see him. Remember... It's not that God has been far away from Jacob. It's that Jacob has just never opened his eyes, never been in a context to actually experience God's presence, God's reality before. You know, when I was uh, in college, I went on a mission trip to Dominican Republic. Um, I had no money. I didn't speak any Spanish. I, I wasn't familiar with the culture. And we were left to, I was left by myself to live with a fairly poor Dominican family. And we had a hard time communicating. It, it was a hard time. During that time, I realized I relied on so many things that I, I didn't really realize that I was relying upon. Things like having money, language, culture, modern comfort, phone, no phones at that time. Not even a house phone. And during my time there, I felt like I was stripped of all things that were familiar. And that's when God really started to show up in a powerful way. That's when seeking his presence became real. That's when God's presence became real in my life. You know, when things are going well... When my family is going well, when, my church, when our church is going well, uh, I feel like those wellness actually block us from a real encounter with God. But when things are going tough, when things are tough, when, when I feel like things that I rely on is stripped away, when we're going through a time when I feel like I'm sort of laid bare. When I feel weak, I am reminded that that is the moment when God's greatest participation and involvement in my life will be revealed. I think that's why Apostle Paul said um, about what the Lord said to him in 2 Corinthians verse 12. Uh, chapter 12, verse 9, he says, My grace, this is Jesus speaking to Apostle Paul, he says, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. That's the third meaning of the stairway from heaven. The fourth meaning, the stream shows that it's not the stairway to heaven. I love that song, by the way, by Led Zeppelin. I grew up a fan of Led Zeppelin. Yes, you gotta be like 50 at least 
to be a fan, a real fan of Led Zeppelin's Stairway to Heaven, the great, one of the greatest rock and roll songs ever. But this is not Stairway to Heaven. It's a Stairway from Heaven. Remember when the people, people built the Tower of Babel? It was a ziggurat, um, a, a pyramid-like building with stairs on the side so people can ascend to the top to get to heaven. That, that was what they were trying to do in the Tower of Babel. They built a stairway to heaven, and that's what every religion in the world is trying to do. You have to build a stairway to heaven. That's what every religion, you know, in, 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 you know they, they have these, every religion has these rules. They follow this path, the seven paths, or live by these laws, or, you know, these principles. Then you will get to heaven. All the religions in the world are stairways to heaven. But here God comes down to us and gives us unconditional love. It is God coming to us. It is a stairway from heaven. Jacob doesn't build it. God does. And he comes down on it. Now, I want to end by asking the question, so how does this stairway come about for you and me? How does it come about for you and me? This, the answer to this question actually comes about many centuries later. In the New Testament, John chapter 1, there's an interesting conversation between Jesus and Nathaniel. Nathaniel, who later becomes one of his 12 disciples. At first, Nathaniel is full of prejudice against Jesus because Jesus is from Nazareth, you know, a, a little hick town up north. But Jesus says something that causes him to believe in Jesus. And then Jesus says something interesting to Nathaniel in John chapter 1, verse 50 to 51. He said, this is what he said. Jesus said, you believe because I told you, I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. Then he then added, very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Jesus is intentionally recalling this dream vision of Jacob and says to Nathaniel, you ain't seen nothing yet. You're going to see heaven open up and the angels of God ascending and descending. But Jesus doesn't, wear, uh, doesn't talk about the stairs. Did you notice that? He doesn't talk about the stairs. He says that the angels are ascending and descending on the Son of Man, which is the favor way, his favor way to refer to himself. So he is essentially saying, I am the stair. I am the stairway between heaven and earth. I am the connection between God and you. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. I am the gateway to heaven. I am the truth. I am the resurrection and the life. I am God incarnate who has come down. I am the ideal made real. He says, come to me. I will give you life. I will give you the water of life that will never make you thirsty again. I will give you rest. I will give you forgiveness. I will give you restoration. I will give you healing. I will give you meaning. I will give you a new life where heaven actually opens up to you, where God's presence will be ever real in your life, where God's power will be an everyday reality, where life will overflow in blessing says, come to me. I am the source. I am the stairway from heaven. Would you join me in a word of prayer?
maybe some of you resonated with me when I was talking about this dark place that some of us might be in, that Jacob was in. It's a difficult place. It's a lonely place. But God came down. The stairway from heaven came down. And Jesus is that stairway. Jesus has made a way for us to encounter God and experience beauty. To experience ultimate beauty. And I want to invite you to open your heart and see. Pray. And I want to invite you to start right now, but continue throughout the week. <coughs> Pray. Open your heart. Create moments of silence. And ask that you see and that you encounter the stairway from heaven. And you can take that step right now. All of us are on a journey. And some of us are saying, yo, I am in that dark place. I want to experience that stairway from heaven. I want to experience ultimate beauty. And I invite you to open your heart and pray and start the journey of following Jesus Christ. And it all starts by humbling yourself and saying, Lord, I'm in a dark place. I messed up. Have mercy upon me and begin your journey. That's all it takes. Lord, I messed up. Have mercy upon me and help me to follow you. Help me to see you. Help me to experience you and live out the mission of loving our neighbors, standing with those who are marginalized and bringing justice into this world, bringing mercy into this world bringing thy kingdom come to earth as it is in heaven. Because angels are ascending and descending. God is at work. God calls you and I to participate. But it all starts by an encounter. All starts by an encounter with God. Would you open your heart? Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ, that each and every one who's here will experience the stairway from heaven, will experience Jesus, oh Lord, will experience a connection to you, will experience your beauty so that we cannot help but to be mesmerized by your beauty, your grace, your love, your affirmation. And in our weakness become strong. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen.